Jsou. Dobrý večer nebo dobré odpoledne. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, switch to English because it will be in English. So, uh, first of all, let me welcome uh, you all here. Uh, we are opening uh, our regular uh, lecture series uh, a bit earlier than usually because the students are still uh, on the holidays. Uh, I would like to be on the holidays too, but there is a Forum 2000 conference in, in Prague and uh, we have offered also to uh, to provide our space for some accompanying events and uh, that uh, brings us to uh, mix two things together. So Forum 2000 uh, decided to hold this uh, year the conference earlier already in uh, the half of September and our dear guest here Dr. Amin Tarzi uh, is here as always in, in September because uh, he is uh, uh, lecturing to the Czech uh, military people in uh, in Vyškov or in Brno. Uh, so we could uh, put two things together and uh, to discuss the, what I think is a very interesting debate. You know, we have been meeting 10, 15 years ago quite often and that was this time of, you know, full of optimism. The West was in uh, offensive mood, you know, great plans about uh, Afghanistan, about Iraq, whatever. And now, 15 years after, we are all in certain setback. Uh, there is much more realism uh, in, 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 in the common discourse. So uh, I guess that uh, the team which, uh, which uh, Amin has, uh, uh, has offered to speak, uh, the dilemmas about the democracy in the Middle East, is uh, exactly uh, the discussion or the team which uh, uh, must uh, uh, be uh, discussed. So, uh, I don't want to, uh, to, uh, to spend so much uh, with introducing our guest, uh, just mention that, uh, you know, it's really somebody who is coming here because it's this member of this Tarzi family, it's uh, with the roots in Afghanistan, so it's a really elite, you know, reaching to the royalty, to, uh, to the business people, to the scientific people, to the academician. Uh, so, uh, it's not just the man uh, who is teaching at uh, Marine Corps University in Quantico uh, near Washington, but it's, it's a man with uh, the rich family history. But the rest will be done and managed, and I would be gladly listening just in, in the first row. Uh, and you will be in the hands of the moderator of, of, of this event, uh, Jan uh, Fingerland. Uh, those who uh, observed uh, the Middle Eastern issues uh, uh, certainly know him. I am his uh, regular reader because he's one of those who really uh, reads and reports and analyzes the situation in a quality way. That's rather than an exception among the Czech uh, journalists. So uh, right now he is working at uh, the Czech public radio, but uh, regularly writing in many. Uh, check uh, dailies, uh, weekly, so uh, he is uh, here to, uh, to moderate and uh, uh, to introduce our uh, uh, dear guest in, uh, in uh, more uh, deeper sense. So, one again, welcome and enjoy the evening. Uh, good evening, thank you for your kind introduction, but don't worry, I won't speak very much. If you want to hear me, you are welcome to listen to the Czech Public Radio. Uh, the, the real guest of this evening is uh, Dr. Amin Tarzi. He uh, is here at several institutes, so thank, uh, thanks also to several institutes for uh, making it possible for us to be here. Uh, Dr. Amin Tarzi is uh, the director of the Middle Eastern Studies at Marine Corps University in Quantico, Virginia. He is expert in the Middle East and Southern and Central Asia. He teaches political Islam, cultural intelligence, terrorist organizations, and similar topics. Prior to joining the, the university, he was also with uh, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty's regional analysis team, focusing, focusing on Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, it was here in Prague. He also taught at a number other, of other institutions in the US and abroad. Now he is in Prague, which is a kind of peak of uh, 
of his teaching career. Uh, no, I'm joking because uh, there is another important thing that needs to be mentioned. Uh, Dr. Amin Tarzi was born here in Prague, Podoli. So those of you who, who were born in Prague, unlike me, you can consider him as, his, as uh, your compatriot. Uh, Dr. Amin Tarzi has injured his leg, so he will be lecturing uh, from this place. Uh, um, he will be talking for about 30 minutes, then you will have a chance to uh, ask your questions or simply have a debate with uh, Dr. Tarzi. And um, that's probably all from me, so th thank you for coming and uh, Dr. Tarzi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sasha, for all those kind words. Uh, yes, I was born here, so I do apologize for not speaking the language of my country of birth. Uh, I'm a perpetual refugee, so I have taught small pieces of languages from all of the places that I have gone to. And America was the country that finally accepted me for good, and uh, I chose to speak its language, which is my language, English. Uh, uh, and it's very good to be back home to see friends of old and see friends new. I will make one uh, caveat. I do speak for myself here. Tomorrow, the day after tomorrow in Vishkov, I speak for my government. Right now, I'm not speaking for my government. I am speaking as Amin Tazi, as a citizen, as somebody who wants to talk freely. So please, whatever I say, think of it as my views and not those of the United States Marine Corps, the Defense Department, or any other U.S. government agency. This way we can have an open discussion. And if you want to hear the official line, I can give you a website, and you can get the official website. So I will be speaking very freely on my own. Uh, I thought I would discuss the dilemmas of democracy in the Middle East. Uh, before anything else, when I say Middle East, uh, right there we have a dilemma. What is east of where, middle of what? We all use it. We use it in Arabic, as sharq al awsat Arabs use it. But nobody is even discussing. This is a location. So a location usually always is based on some other location. So if you're east, it's east of what? And that question comes to the point of the the dilemma of the Middle East. And the word dilemma, I don't know if any of you here are leaders of Greek uh, tragedies. I am speaking specifically about the Greek tragedy of people like Sophocles and Euripides. What is a Greek dilemma, a Greek tragedy? A Greek tragedy always has a dilemma. A dilemma are two choices, none of which are good. Two choices, none of which are good. And in the Middle East, and I use the Middle East reluctantly, but because we all use it. I don't like the name, but as I said, everybody uses it. There is a dilemma when it comes to middle democracy. There are choices, none of which are good. So I give you one of my main points right now before we start. What I'll try to talk to you first is a brief review of the United States policies of bringing democracy or supporting democracy in that region we call Middle East. A couple of definitions, because we always talk about democracy, and you are students or faculty or listeners there, but just to put it in context. And then what is going on today with the trends in that part of the world, specifically with the Islamist ideologies. And again, what do I mean by Islamist? I mean any political party, whether they are violent, or not, which uses the religion of Islam for political purposes. So please, I'm not trying to debase the religion of Islam or go against it. All I'm saying, when I say Islamism, I mean any party, political party, group of part people who use the religion of Islam for political purposes, whether that's violent, like Daesh or ISIL, whatever you call it here, or it is a party like AKP in the Republic of Turkey. They're both Islamists. One is an elected official and one is a terrorist organization. So I don't mean good or bad, I just mean a trend, a political trend which uses the religion of Islam. When you look at the American concept of democracy, we have some four main elements. 
One is a political system for choosing and replacing the government through fear, free and fair elections. Two is active participation of the people as citizens in political civic life. This goes back to your late president, Václav Havel. It's the civic aspect of democracy, that there has to be a civil society. Without a civil society and a civil society which is active, you cannot have a democracy, a functioning democracy. Thirdly, and this is important with the case of Middle East, protection of human rights for all citizens. And I underline that, all. Not because if you're a woman or a lesbian or you uh, believe in a different religion, then you are outside. It means all. And then fourth, and that's very important, a rule of law in which the laws and procedures apply equally to all citizens. This is the ideal. This is the ideal. We have this maybe some places in the world. We have it in the Nordic countries. We try in the United States to have it. But as we know in reality, many democracies, including our own, fall short in some of these aspects. That's the ideals at least that founding fathers of my country started this idea of democracy in the new world as we call America today. Another definition on electoral democracy is means, democracy means national sovereignty in which it is the hands of the people that sovereignty goes through and not any special group. So it goes back to the old Greek word demos kratis, ruled by the people. Now I'll go ahead and tell you something may not be very popular here. There was an agenda in the United States to bring these ideals of democracy into the Middle East. And the first one in the recent memory, so I'm not going to talk about history of the United States in the past, started with George W. Bush. I know right now he is the one who everybody looks at, perhaps most people blaming for most of what's happening in the Middle East, but he started with a agenda on democracy in the Middle East. And what he wanted was limited power of the state and the power of the military so that the government respond to the will of the people. And he also wanted protection of freedom, and this is a direct quote from him, with the consistent and impartial rule of law. Again, consistent and impartial rule of law. Allowing room for a healthy civic institution for political parties and labor unions and independent newspapers and broadcast media. Then guaranteeing religious freedom. Privatizing economies, prohibiting and punishing corruption, and lastly, recognition of women's rights. This is based on, on this. The United States started something that was called the freedom, freedom Agenda. You all know that the main aspect of that started in Afghanistan, as we just heard, with a lot of euphoria. I remember here in 2002, in this very city of, beautiful city of Prague, we were all euphoric. The Taliban were ousted. We all, including your country, the Czech Republic, 87 countries were involved in Afghanistan. And we are looking at a bright future for this new page of democratization. Almost Afghanistan was looked, whether we liked it or not, today we may not look at it this way, as almost as a locomotive to pull the region towards a more democratic system. Of course, in the case of the United States, uh, and history will judge that, and I'll tell you myself, I don't think it was a very, uh, very wise policy. The uh, United States went to Iraq in 2003, and Iraq was, this idea of democracy was forced by the military power. In my personal view, this was a step backwards, not forward. But it was part of, I know people can judge whichever way. It was part of this idea that you replace Iraq, a very important Arab country, the cradle of Arab civilization in some senses, with a democratic head, if you would, this Frankenstein of democracy then moves forward. There was an idea behind it. Obviously, it did not work. And then you have President Obama. 
but I'll end here with the US, I'll jump to the Middle East. President Obama, partially because of the issues of Afghanistan, but specifically because of Iraq, took a very different approach. And those approaches, again, I'm not going to read for you, there were two main speeches right in 2009 after he was elected, one in Istanbul and the more famous one in Cairo, in which he talked about democracy in terms of a process which the United States will help, but the United States would not force. But he challenged the very governments that were the allies of the United States of America, namely Egypt, which he was speaking at. President Hosni Mubarak was an ally of the United States from 1981 when he took power after the assassination of uh, President Sadat. A full ally, without anything, whatever we asked, we got from Egypt. I'm not going to give you details, but we got almost everything we wanted. An ally of Israel, which is for the United States, it's very, very crucial. Safety of Israel is part of our national uh, agenda. And that was democracy without force, but democracy with persuasion. <coughs> Here, I would say that what has happened is that you had a lot of also elections in the Arab world, which unfortunately, none of them. Tunisia is still an open case. Other than Tunisia, none of them led to democratization. So this is important to, I told you the word dilemma. You have had elections. Let, us, let me tell you first, Hamas. The Israelis leave Gaza Strip. There's an election. Fair, fair enough. According to any standard you see, it was not maybe standards of Europe, but it was fair. Who wins? Hamas. Hamas is anything but democratic. But they came to power through a democratic process. And then, of course, the big case, Iraq and then Egypt. And Iraq, the Arab world regarded Iraq always as the cradle of Arab civilization, but whether we like it or not, they regard it as a Sunni cradle. The state of Iraq, as we have it, is a modern phenomenon. There was no such thing as Iraq before. It was three provinces. What is today Iraq used to be three provinces of the Ottoman Empire. But the state of Iraq, the way the demographics was shifted in the post-Ottoman period, favored the Shias. So in a democracy, obviously, who wanted Iraq? The Shia still are winning because they tend to vote for their own people. So democracy actually pushed Iraq back into a situation where confrontation started rather than progress towards a form of government which leads to more inclusiveness. It actually became more divisive. And then, of course, the first case of Egypt. I'm not going to give you every case because, unfortunately, each and every one of them have led to something almost disastrous, if not very good. In case of Egypt, one of the oldest countries on earth, Perhaps the only election, and I, not perhaps, I'll tell you, the only real election in Egypt's history, again, not fully open, not fully transparent, was the election in which the Muslim brothers, or brotherhood, if you want to call it, al-Ikhwan al-Muslimin in Arabic, they win. They win five elections in the two and a, a year and a half period. And they did not cheat much. So the question here is, what is the agenda of an organization such as the Muslim Brothers? Is it democratic? No. They don't tell you that it is. But they used the tool of democracy to gain power and usher an undemocratic society. So this is the question, as I said, I use the word dilemma in the Greek sense. Think about it. So we wish democracy. You get through the democratic processes of elections, a government that by its nature is undemocratic, by its nature is exclusive. And here in the conference, actually, a Danish colleague, not colleague, but a Danish speaker said something about the Muslims in Europe talking about uh, how they can be part of Europe and be accepting democracy. He used two words which I agree with him. One was that they have to, if they come to Europe, 
they have to go against the law of blasphemy, and secondly, apostasy. You know what I'm talking about. Within this, the Islamist ideology right now, you cannot say anything. You cannot really have a debate about Islam. If they feel insulted, you are threatened to death. Simple as that. In case of apostasy, is even worse because apostasy means leaving your religion. So if they deem somebody is not a real Muslim for whatever reason, that person is again, by nature, convicted to, be, to killing. I include one more thing to this two thing. It's right of women. I don't buy this whole idea that it's traditional. If you come into a society, you cannot disown half of your society or more than half. On any grounds you want it, whether it's tradition, whether it is... So with these aspects, and there are other things, but these, I think, the two that were stated here in the, conf in the panel yesterday, I think, was, I add that rights of women. These aspects alone create more of a civil society would bring religion as part of a dialogue, not outside of it. I'm not saying that religion should be taken totally out of it. It's a reality. If you look at the history of this part of the world, how did democracies come here? In my view, the very first important aspect is that there is a, first of all, there was a lot of wars. Those of you who know the history of this part of the world, you know what happened here. The 30 year war, part of the Hundred Year War, defenestrations, Catholic killing Protestant, Protestant killing Catholic. There was a lot of violence leading to what? Leading to the right for you, your forefathers, to do two things. Number one, to have a freedom of conscience at home, meaning you can be Christian, you can be Jewish, you can be atheist. And secondly, to have this right in the public sphere. Nobody drags you to church today. If you go, you're free. If you don't go, nobody comes and says, okay, you, you, got, you better go to church today. That is a very important aspect. I, I will tell you today that without that freedom of conscience in both the private sphere and secondly, in the public sphere, liberal democracies that we know in the West is absolutely impossible. You have to accept the right of the minority, the right of the other. If you cannot accept that, you cannot have a government in which the minority has a right to exist and has a right to have a voice. Giving a voice to the minority is part of this aspect of democratization. Now, let me... Let me tell you what is the Islamist uh, agenda, at least in my view. Here you have to look at, I, I kind of hinted, but I will tell you, why is the Middle East, specifically the Arab Middle East, so different? In 2000, again, if you remember in 2000, 2001, those of us who were working on this, the euphoria was there, democratization had occurred here, of course, after the disillusionment in mean, the 90s, Latin America was embracing democracy. Africa, there was only one exception, Middle East, and there were questions being raised. Is it because of Islam or is it because of the Arab psyche? In my view, it has nothing to do with Arab psyche. Arabs are very different people from Morocco to Iraq. You have Arabs who are totally different people. Yes, they share language, and even that is the official language, but if they speak to each other in Morocco and Iraq, you won't even understand each other. So what is it? What I will try to tell you, and then if it's Islam, why is Indonesia successful? Why is Malaysia successful? I was just last year in Indonesia. I'm not an expert of Indonesia, but I was very impressed. 3,600 islands inhabited, almost 5,000 kilometers from one end to the other end. Every religion you can imagine, somehow coexisting. Somehow coexisting. It's not ideal, they have had their clashes, but it is moving forward. So I don't think it's about Islam either. So what's going on? In my view, it has to do 
with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Unless we look at what the history of Middle East, and this goes back to what I said, Middle East of what? I'll, I'll not keep you suspended. It's east of, the, east of Britain. The whole idea of Middle East was an idea that came out from here, not to your country, but it came out from Europe, specifically Britain, and less so France. And it was an idea to destroy and weaken the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire at the time was the biggest challenge to Europe. And once the destruction of the Ottoman Empire was completed, there was this quest of creating new nation states. However, those nation states were not created based on national or state identity. And here again, I have to differentiate between state and nation. At least in America, we keep on using them as if they are the same thing. They are not. A state is actually a political boundary based on a European concept, Westphalian concept, later on the Bavarian concept of what a state is. It's a territory which is marked, you know all of that, that's political science 101. A nation is an, is an ideal. A nation doesn't exist, it's not tangible. So we made those, we collectively, created these nation states, which half of them should have even not been there. And what happened after World War, after the Ottoman Empire, if you think there was an earthquake, think of it as an earthquake. There was a big earthquake, and the earth is still shifting. And that is disallowing normalcy. That's disallowing normalcy. So what happens? When does Islamism come true? If you look at Islamism, the ideas of Islamism, I, comes in the ideas in the 1870s. For the first time, you have Arab thinkers thinking about a way out. A way out of, at the time the Ottomans are still there, but there's the malaise. Europe is moving ahead, and the Arabs are moving behind. And the question comes up, why are we so behind? If you want the, the main writers, there's a lot of them. I'll name you two. One is Muhammad Abdu, who is an Egyptian. He was actually the Mufti of Egypt. And the second one was Gamal al-Din al-Afghani. Uh, he claimed to be Afghan, he was actually Iranian, but that doesn't matter. But he was a thinker. And they have these ideas of what to do. I'm not going to bore you with that in the Q&A, what their plans were. But this was not about violence. The word jihad was never used. It was about thinking, using European ideologies, technology to move forward. And then when Islamism becomes a party, is 1929. We have a specific date. It happens in Egypt, and the party is none other than Muslim Brotherhood. It's created by four people, three of which are teachers. It's created as a response to British colonialism and as a response to the lack of civil society and distribution of healthcare and food among people. Ikhwan al-Muslimin comes because of one thing. Response to the collapse of Ottoman Empire, one. They call for a return to Islam, programs of mass education. The theme of the conference is democracy and education. They're talking about education to Islamicize that message. Social economic reform, implementation of Islamic legislation, i.e. Sharia. And they say all of that is only possible after the British withdrawal. So it's an anti-colonial movement by nature. And then they say that it's an eventual formation of what they call an Islamic state. They do not define what it is. These are the main agendas of Ikhwan al-Muslimin. Very important aspect, it is absolutely nonviolent. It's almost Gandhian, almost, in its nature. This shifts in the 1960s. And I'm going to go fast over this. In the 60s, you have a, specifically, again, there's one man whose work is very pivotal, but it's not just one man. This man is still being read by the people who are damaging Europe and everywhere else. His name was Said Qutb. He was an Egyptian as well. He comes and says, no. What we want cannot happen in a 
evolutionary process. We need a revolution. And the revolution, you have two choices. I'm simplifying it. You have Islam and you have Gahiliya, Jahiliya. Jahiliya refers to pre-Islamic ignorance of the Arabian Peninsula. And there is no way that these two can actually coexist. Can, do you hear that coming out today? Those of you who are if listening to Daesh or ISIL, it's almost the same language. It's us against them. And the concept here is very important that we, the Muslims, have been, we used to be powerful, now we are not powerful, and we have to regain our power. So it becomes a question of power. How you get that power? If democracy takes you, ahlan wa sahlan, go ahead, do it. If violence gets you, you can get it whichever way you want. But the, the idea, and this is very important, that the end game is not a civil society that Western liberal democracy wants it. And that split, I think, is still creating this, 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 this dilemma. It is what leads to groups such as Daesh. Now, if you look at the Islamist dialogue today, there is a dialogue. There is a dialogue among them. They're about, again, these are not only things, these are not exclusive, but I'll give you seven main points that they talk about. One is definition of who is a Muslim and personal rights. This goes back, this is why I think that the, the Danish speaker was very right. Who is a Muslim? It's very important. What makes you a Muslim? And of course, if you're not a Muslim, then what? The second point is use of violence. There's a lot of debate on whether or not violence should be used. The third one is definition of Sharia and whether or not Sharia is compatible with democracy. There's a lot of discussion on that. Fourth, should political parties be formed or Islamists should be in opposition? Why? Because they say if political parties are formed, even if they win, they're going to be pushed out. Of course, the case of Egypt is the best one. Look, we won, square and fair, or the other case in the 90s, some of you may remember Algeria, where the Al Algerian Islamists were about to win, but they were pushed out. Role of women. They're obsessed with role of women. This is where they, they, they show their stripes. Relations with non-Muslims, from living together to what you see right now in Iraq and Syria, to enslaving them, killing them, converting them, forced conversion. And this also has direct relations to what your country is doing right now. Whether you like it or not, this upheaval is sitting right at, in south of your border. Right now in Hungary, I think they're having a little problem, to say the least. It is part of this reality. I'm not here to scare anybody. Or what, all I'm saying is it's a reality that's happening. And how to respond to that with understanding. Again, we are speaking on a theme here of democracy and education. We need to educate ourselves before we can take any action, whether it is in the civic arena or in political arena or anything else. The last thing that they are talking about is relations with the West, whether there is any other rule that the opposition. This is the debate. There's only one aspect of it which has democracy, whether Sharia is compatible or not. So there is a debate, there's a little kindling there that, that could be used in order to move forward, but it's not the dominant discourse. I'm gonna, uh, I don't know what I'm doing on time. I'm okay. I think you're okay. okay. Uh, I have a lot of aspects of democratic move, but I will also leave you with the Islamist, what I, I this is my own little creation of uh, using Microsoft analogy and where we stand for it. And I think with that, we can come to, to modern day. This is my own little chart. If you look at Islamism 1.0, it is late 19th century, ideas to fill the Ottoman void. Again, you cannot look at Islamism. We do it in a lot of places we work. We look at it from Iraq, or sometimes we look at it at Afghanistan, the Taliban or the Al-Qaeda, 
unless you look at the Ottoman, I'm not saying you should go back to Muhammad or the Crusades, no, no. But you have to look at the Ottomans. Because I don't think that whole story of the Ottoman Empire's demise is yet finalized. We are still, uh, we are still debating, or as I said, the earth is still readjusting. The plates of the earth are readjusting. So if you don't know that, you're going to be finding yourself shift on the shifting ground. Islamic, Islamism 1.1. As I said, the first party, 1928-29, Ikhwan al-Muslimin, anti-colonial, nationalist, social services oriented, and important, non-violent. Islamism 1.2. Emergence of the idea of takfir, anathema. What is takfir, anathema? This is where you call somebody else a non-Muslim, that you are a kafir. Then you can kill him. And other things, as you see today what's happening. This starts in the 1960s, targeting locally initially Egyptian leadership and use of violence. So the use of violence is not something that was initially there. It comes in the 60s. Islamism 1.3, conceptualization of an ideal Islamic state. This happens in the 1970s. For the first time, they actually conceptualize what an Islamic state should look like. Again, if you want, those of you who are interested in the writings, the best person to read is an Indian, later on Pakistani writer by the name of Abul Allah Maududi. He wrote an incredible amount of books. He conceptualizes it. Again, look at today Daesh. Baghdadi calls himself Khalifa, but he doesn't use the word Al-Halaf al-Islamiyya, or Islamic, Islamic Caliphate. He specifically uses the word Islamic State. By just that name, he is challenging everything we stand for. He can use, as I said, Khalafa is a very good Arabic word. He uses a Dawla al Islamiyah, Islamic State, or Daesh, a Dawla al Islamiyah, for Iraq or Shabbat. Daesh. Sham is basically equivalent to, Lebanon, uh, to Levant, which includes Syria, Lebanon, and parts of Israel. So why is he using that? Think about it. They're not dumb, by the way. So now I go to Islamic. Islamism 2.0. 2.0, so I told you 1.1 to 1.4. 2.0 is you have the internationalist Islamism. And here I'm talking specifically about Al Qaeda and Afghanistan and Pakistan. That now the concept is no more local because up to that, even the concept of Islamic State is localized within either Egypt, Pakistan, or local. Al Qaeda takes it a step. Beyond, it becomes internationalized. Islam has no boundaries. That's the term. It's the Ummah al Islamiyah, the Islamic community, not a state. So therefore, we can discuss anything. Any place there is a Muslim, we, i.e. the Islamic Islamist party is responsible for it. Whether they are Czech citizens, American citizens, Czech-born, German-born, Korean-born, doesn't matter. If they are a the Muslim, they are part of our Ummah. Again, this is a huge issue that we have to deal with. 2.1, Al-Qaeda shifts its ideology to attacking larger targets. 9-11, basically. In 2.2, up to 9-11, up to if you look at Osama bin Laden's every single speech, you hear not one time anything sectarian. What do I mean by that? He does not say anything about the Shia. It's all Islam. In my view, 2.2 is invasion of Iraq. Post-Iraq invasion 2003, you get a new field, which is the anti-sect, the sectarian version. If you want, I would say this would be the worst case, the worst symbol of it is Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, the Jordanian, where killing of Shias become almost a ritual. So that's the 2.2. And then I jumped to 3.0, which is what we deal with right now. I do not think that Daesh is in the same level. Number one, and this is the most important aspect, Daesh is first time an Islamist group has a territory. It is territorial. They are territorial for a very specific reason. They are using every symbol of state 
that we in Europe created it or it was created here. They have a specific territory. Al-Qaeda never had a name, by the way. We named Al-Qaeda. Simply means the base in Arabic. They did not call themselves Al-Qaeda. We called them because we wanted a name for them. These people have named themselves. I just came back from Turkey, actually, last week, right here. You can buy their patches, exactly the same way we have it. You know, you can take it off and put it on Velcro. They have every symbol of state. They have police cars, they collect garbage. Every Tuesday, they collect garbage. Raqqa. Every Tuesday. So they're doing all the, all the aspects of state. And they call themselves a state, a dawla. In Arabic, dawla simply means a state. And in my view, they're shifting the entire paradigm of the state. And for us, looking at the West, at this whole aspect, we talk about democracy, they are talking the very concept of state. Whatever we talk about, we talk about in the concept of state. We have no other language. And I'm not saying language in the sense of English or Czech or German or Russian. We talk, an entire international relationship in our system is based on the concept of state. Or better or worse, because of European experience, a state is what we, we, we deal with. State is good or bad, we talk within the state concept. Democracy is only a, a tool to run a state better. Well, they are challenging the very concept of state. Don't think these refugee ideas are, are not helping them. They are helping them immensely. Because whatever happens, they will, not you. You pick all the refugees here. Yeah, by the way, I'm a refugee, so I'm not against refugees. But at the same time, whatever you do, they win. Because they are challenging the very concept, as I said, of European state notion. Somebody said it this morning that the new Islamist parties are actually looking more, they're not looking at America's target, they're looking at Europe. And I agree with that for two main reasons. Reason number one, you're right there. We still have tanked on a, a little ocean between us. They don't have a navy yet. Daesh, with all of his great territory, is a landlocked state. And I call it a state. I know we don't like to, officially, we don't call him a state. We don't even call him Daesh. We don't even call him Islamist. In Washington, we call them what? Violent organizations. Violent extremist organizations. We don't even use the word terrorist anymore. Violent extremist organizations. I think, I think not calling them what they are, in my view, and this is me talking, doesn't, doesn't solve the issue. For you, those who you study, those of you who are active, this is a reality. And it challenges not only the security of your countries, it's going to challenge your democracies. It's challenging your democracy as you, we speak. So, the democracy dilemmas in the Middle East is not just what happens there. Today, it's a collective issue. And we need to look at it for a collective response. And the response cannot be one way. It's not education alone. Education is a very long-term thing. Unfortunately, we are, not, we are not privileged to have that kind of a, 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 a time. It's not military. As we saw, military doesn't help. It is not economic. It is a combination of all of those. And this is where we need to focus our attention. And I'm, I'm really glad that you had a conference with that title of democracy in it. Because right now, a lot of places, including my country, the word democracy almost has become an F word. You know what I mean by that when I say F word. So you don't say that. No, really, it is. We don't, we don't use it. The D word is the F word now. That cannot happen. That's the greatest asset we have. We cannot put our greatest asset in our pocket because that is now a bad word. Because it didn't work one time or twice. Because what else we have to offer? And we cannot wall ourselves. Trust me, you cannot barbed wire yourself from reality. The world has shown that more than one time. So again, as I started, in my view, the word dilemma, two choices, none of which are good, or here, there's more than two choices, is what's, what's facing us. We had, what you said, Sasha, 
2002, those are good old days. I think we are back in for, and it's just not democracy and Islamism. We have some other not very democratic forces from other sides. And they, they happen not to be Muslim, but they have uber Christianity. They think that they are representing uber Christianity coming in. I'm not scaring anybody, but all I'm saying is the 10, 15 years of, of kumbaya is over. We need to think harder. I'm not saying it's the end of the world. I think we have enough power, in this, not power, I mean military might, enough intellectual power, enough belief in our system that we can withstand it. But it is not the time to just sit back and relax. I think, unfortunately, this generation, the younger one I'm talking to, uh, you just lost that. I wish I could come here and tell you much more positive aspects of Middle East. That's where my, my, my background comes in. My most, most of my background is, is Afghan. I have a little sprinkling of Syrian there, two beautiful countries one time. Both of them are not almost in, in the map anymore. So, uh, but I try always to have a positive outlook. So my positive outlook uh, right now is I'm trying very hard to be honest than just say something that is rosy. With that, I think I will... Uh, turn the table to your side and you take it from here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tarsi, for a very illuminating uh, speech. And it's, uh, it's uh, not formal words for me. I fulfilled, uh, filled in four pages of notes. So I really mean it. Uh, when you talk about uh, democratic uh, dilemmas, after all, here in Central Eastern Europe, not all countries have succeeded in transforming themselves into a democratic country. There are at least two of them that did not succeed. So we know very well how a difficult process it is. Uh, you have been talking a lot about the other side, which means that the Islamists came and fulfilled or filled in the void after uh, various uh, great historical processes. At the same time, you mentioned uh, uh, Indonesia and Malaysia uh, that can serve as a successful example of uh, Islamic democracy. Uh, so I will use my privilege to ask you uh, the first question, so my, my question is, do you see a debate in the Middle East or South Asia about a new kind of democracy that would be specifically tailored for that region? And uh, I specifically mean if there is uh, some local intellectual production of that. Recently we saw uh, demonstrations in Iraq that were calling for reforms and democracy under Iraqi flags, so maybe there are more sources of this uh, hope because at the end of the day, the dilemma has to be overcome. So are there some local sources of uh, hope? Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm fully aware of, of uh, that some of the neighborhood here is, is, uh, is not democratic. I, 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 my son is Russian. I'm, you think about international, I am as international as they come. Uh, we adopted a child from Ulan Ude in Siberia, so I have traveled there. Trust me, it's not a democracy, uh, not even close to it. Uh, but back to your question, it, that, that is the key. What happens, and you said it, I didn't. I'm glad that you did. Whatever solution comes out there, in my view, it has to come from within those parts of the world. Whether they take ideas from West, within, from their own cultures, Collectively, it has to be ingrown. I do not believe under any circumstances that democracy could be like a pill. Here, have one democracy every morning. By eight, eight one weeks later, you are a Democrat. And I'm saying with Democrat with a small d, not the US pol political system. It doesn't work like that. And yes, there is a debate. The debate I told you, again, this is something mostly from the Islamist parties. The Islamist party is still at the top tier. They talk about democracy. They do actually still talk about whether it's compatible with Sharia or not, how to do it. But they are not the ones to bring in democracy, in my view. The question here is the debate has to, how to include the Islamic religion 
which is a part and parcel of this part of the world. It's part of the identity into a coexistence. And the reason I, again, I, my, my problem is I'm not really an expert. I don't speak in any of the Indonesian languages, but I have tried to travel there because I'm looking, trying to find an inspiration. What was very interesting to me, again, as another expert, so I have to underline that, I'm not an Indonesian expert, but they told me what was going on. I was there in an official capacity, so I heard the government side, but I went to the civil society. The government did not stop me from going there. There is a civil society. It's, it's, it's absolutely paramount for the beginning of a, any kind of a democratic system to have a civil society where the youth, where the people take part in. They have that. And they debate it. And they, let me tell you the debate that was interesting. You may remember a few years ago, in 2004, 2005, there were these bombings in Indonesia, in Bali, in Bande Aceh. Bande Aceh is the easternmost port in Indonesia. As we speak in Bande Aceh, Sharia is being implemented. You may say, oh, this is not good. Actually, it is because of that that terrorism has almost gone to a nil. Because people in Bande Aceh actually worked to get the, the ones who are blowing up places in, in, in Bali and more to the west. Because Indonesia, as you go e more east, it becomes more Muslim. Indonesia, by the way, was not conquered by Muslims. It became Muslim through trade. So it's a very different system. So what I say is, if, the, if, the, if a region, the majority of which want to have a system of government based on Islamic law, and the majority accept, perhaps that's not something that we collectively say, no, you can't. Is there a right of women? No, it's not the same as you want. But the majority have accepted it. But yet, as a whole, the country is now accepting this otherness. Actually, I was very, again, this is symbolic, but I want to find something good. I have to. I have to. The, the main church in, 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 in the Jakarta has a Catholic church uh, made by the Dutch. They share the same parking lot with the largest mosque there. So on Sundays, the church uses it. On Fridays, the... And I was... Uh, it's Friday mosque uses it. I actually was happy about that. I said, you know what, at least here in the largest Muslim country, by the way, there are more Muslims in Indonesia than any country in the world. The church, the main cathedral, and the main mosque actually share parking. And the clean work is both. So they both use it, and then they send crews to clean it up for the beginning of the week. Symbolic, little, but you know what? You have to hang on to stuff like that, because the other side is not very good. So yes, there's also the youth in countries like Afghanistan. Is Afghanistan a democracy? Not really. But with all the damages to the elections of Afghanistan that's happened, they still try to find a way. Afghans lost fingers, not one or two people. They lost their lives. I know in your country I heard that less than 20% vote. If I have one message to you, for God's sake, vote. People die for this right. In my country, people don't vote either. But here people stand against the Taliban, some absolute nutcases to vote because they still believe in this concept. So as, as, as imperfect as the system is, there is a debate. I think the debate is coming in from the youth. In some countries, there's fear. And this is the problem. And when I talk about countries such as Syria, uh, such as uh, partially Egypt right now, Iraq. Iraq is actually, there is some, some debate going on. It has to come from within. And they need a space of that violence. It is very hard to think about participation in democracy when somebody is shooting at you. So you need, in my view, at least a, 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 a level of security to begin thinking like that. And that's the, I mean, you are asking the key question. It has to come from within. But if somebody is shooting at you, it's very hard to think democracy. So I hope that I answered your question. You did. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to encourage anyone in the public uh, who would like to ask any question, preferably in English, but also in the case of necessity in Czech. So please raise your hand. Uh, I see one colleague. Uh, so, sorry, uh, Tomáš Poyar, please. Uh, 
is it a way for introducing democracy in countries like Afghanistan if we happen to invade something again in the next 10 years, which might happen, um, more, in a more gradual way, introducing democracy on like local election, then on regional elections, and then slowly and surely removing, like, it's bad to say, the colonial governance and giving uh, governance to the people on slower, slower approach than just, let's say, okay, we are here, Let's, let's have the first elections. Uh, yes. I think in Afghanistan, again, retrospectively, we have a saying in the, in the American military that hindsight is always 2020. And when we look backwards, it's always perfect. Huh? Uh, yes. I think what we did in Afghanistan, specifically in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan, we had certain peace with us. We, we collectively, again, in the city of Bonn, not far from here, <clears throat> in December 2001, we gathered it did a shorter than this, this is five pages, it was four and a half pages, a blueprint for Afghanistan to go from Taliban, maybe one of the worst regimes in recent memory. Daesh is actually giving the Taliban a good name. Uh, other than Daesh, maybe the worst regime we had seen in the recent memory, to, and I won't even say Czech Republic or America, to a Norway. That was our vision. It was all more facade building rather than institution building. If you want to build democracy, first, as I said, it has to come from civil society, but also it has to come through institutions, not elections. I always tell people, Adolf Hitler was elected, square and fair. Elections do not lead to a liberal system of human rights, of participation. So yes, you're absolutely right. And if we have a chance, I, first of all, I don't think we will get that coalition. That was a coalition of, it, it, it was under very interesting circumstances. Your country willingly sent soldiers there. 87 countries sent soldiers to Afghanistan, 87. One country I won't name had eight people and six dogs, but they wanted to be there. Uh, they were important dogs, they were mind-sniffing dogs. So, yes, and again, Afghanistan, if nothing else, we should look at these things rather than saying, okay, they were very bad. We should say what we should learn from it, especially I'm sitting right now in a, in a university, in a college. These are, I think, important case studies in our lifetimes. You have still people who are in it to learn, and hopefully the next time around, if that chance comes in, maybe Syria. Syria, I, I hope for the sake of those people that there will be something there. We can't destroy it, you know, one of the, you know, area. So what to do next? And again, it will be a slow process. A, it, look, my own country. When did the United States of America got its independence from King George III? 1776, I'll tell you. When did we have our first president inaugurated? 1789. It took us 13 years with some of the most intellectually sound men on earth gathered in the same place. 13 years. Same language, same history, same thing to put a president in the United States. But we decided that we go to Afghanistan and in three and a half years we turned the Taliban to Norway. So expectations have to be a little bit also right then. Thank you. Thank you. This, this time it's Tomáš Hoyer. I have two questions. One, sure. one is more technical. You, if I understood correctly, the, the, the concept of this Islamic State, the Vlad al-Islamiyya, is the Maududis concept? And, uh, or what was the linkage exactly? And the other one, I have not heard the word tribal. I, my explanation of the non-compatibility or the least or the weakest compatibility of the Middle East uh, or the, the core Middle East uh, uh, with modernity, and I don't mean modernity positively or negatively, or modernity and democracy then, which I mean positively, has been the mixture of the traditional political or the conservative political Islam with the tribal originally nomadic society, which you don't find this mixture, you don't find in Indonesia, you don't find it so strongly in, in, in Afghanistan, you don't find it in other 
places where there is a Muslim, we don't find it in Turkey, in a certain way, which has been more compatible with modernity and more successful in democracy, pluralism, etc. So what is, am I wrong, or, or what, is the, what is this concept of the mixture of the political Islam and the tribal, originally nomadic society as the cocktail which doesn't work with the other parts of the world? Thank you. Uh, on the first question, when I mentioned Maududi, I had this progression of Islamism, and I say that in the 70s they finally conceptualized political uh, Islamic state under Maududi's work. Does the Islamic state today exactly what Maududi said? No. But it is the concepts, for the first time in the 1970s, they germinate into actually a specific, because in 28, 29, Hassan Banda, the main founder of Muslim Brotherhood, talked about Islamic State. He never said what it was. Whereas Maududi conceptualized it, and I think Islamic State today, a lot of them have read those people, and many others. So that was basically a progression that I just gave you an example of who I think is like the founding father, if you would, in literature at least, of the modern state of what is Islamic State. It doesn't go to, you know, to Muhammad. It, it's a very modern phenomenon. Your second question is much more complicated and I don't have a direct answer because this debate goes on almost daily basis. The only thing, so I, no, you're not wrong. The only thing I will say is, of the countries you mentioned, yes, Iraq, 100%, Syria, but what about Egypt? Egypt is not a tribal state. There are no concepts, except for the Sinai. When you look at, at Egypt per se, Egypt is a very much I mean, people say, you know, you have to have urbanization. Well, Egypt has, the mass of Egyptians live in two cities. Cairo and Iskandaria, I mean, sorry, Alexandria. That's why, I mean, the Delta, if you, those of you have been to Egypt, I mean, with, with, from the beginning of the Delta here, which is Cairo, and going up when the Delta opens up, that's, that's Egypt. The rest of Egypt is maybe, I don't know, I'm not, I have a specific existence. It could be only 10% of the population. So you have a very much a a population that dwells and Egyptians don't have a tribal affinity. And it still functions as a state, unlike Syria, they do. Iraq, India. But look at the democratic aspect of it, though. So that, I, again, I'm not discounting what you say. This is the only, what you said, sir, is the only thing that still is being said, okay, it's the admixture of resentment. This is what most people say. They're resentful from the West for destroying the Ottomans. Not that they like the Ottomans, the Arabs didn't like the Ottomans, but that, who cares, you know. They were, but they were cheated. The very first thing what, what Baghdadi did was he said he was gonna undo the Sykes-Picot agreement. How many of you here have heard of Monsieur, Sy Monsieur Picot and Mr. Sykes? Some of you, well you have, great. But a lot of people, both in France and, and, and UK may not even know the name. I'm glad that people here have heard it, which is important. Picot was French, Sykes was British, negotiated a secret agreement on division of what is today Syria, south of Turkey, Iraq, and so on. He said it, he said, I'm undoing it. So there's resentment, there's this idea that the West cheated them, that they want power back, don't forget. Indonesia doesn't want power back. That's very important. I didn't see anybody in Indonesia saying, okay, we want to conquer this or that. And they even gave up East Timur. Reluctantly, but they did. Through an international system. Those are important aspects. Those, I think, are shows a maturity that you don't see in this part because there's a lot of resentment, victimization. And this, I add with it, what you just said, the tribal aspect of it, and then this modernist Islam, which is almost looks at Islam as, this is why I say this 1960s, is, to me is a threshold of that there is no, there is no other way than confrontation. And this is what you said, that with the new debate. Is there a new debate? Yes. The sad point is, I know there are very few, but when people are born here, Again, when I say here, I don't mean Czech Republic. I don't think you have a lot of Daesh issue yet. But France, Belgium, the Netherlands, born and bred, then they go back and they become the jihadists. The question here is, what happens? So they were not tribal anymore here. And, and 
we have to look a little deeper. Do I have the answer? I wish I did. But, but I'm, not say, I'm not discounting your point. I just think that it is, we have to dig deeper to find it, it, there's some other layer that I can't put pinpoint right now. I, but I, th I think this is why I'm, my main contribution, if you would, is I keep on looking at the Ottoman Empire and the demise thereof and the response of the Arabs, they still haven't found a response to it. So the question is, transition to what? A democracy transitions to something. That question is not answered. Maybe this is the answer I can give you. From here to where? They don't know that where. You, Mr. Vondra. Well, uh, a simple question, whether uh, the solution could not be an introduction or a reintroduction of the monarchies, in particular in the world which uh, where is mixing the Arab and the Islamic uh, factor. Uh, because this Arab world, which is tribal based, so here, you know, you have a dynastic uh, element, so it could somehow uh, make it easy to, uh, to govern in the tribal based society. Uh, regarding Islam, so there is not the division of uh, the secular and uh, religious, uh, which is in fact uh, the heritage of uh, the Ottoman Empire itself, not the destruction, but the, the, the very existence for more than 300 uh, years that they did not secularize. Yeah. And then s Islam is refusing that. So even in Turkey, which was forcefully uh, secularized, is now by AKP is somehow returning Islam back to the uh, mixing back with the state. Uh, so, and given the fact that they are, two countries are stable. They don't have any oil resources. It's Morocco and Jordan, and they are monarchies. So I would say monarchies maybe is better than the republic. And then a sub-question, Afghanistan, which is not an Arab country, uh, if we uh, reintroduced the monarchy uh, 10 years ago, uh, wouldn't it be better now? Uh, if my, my dear grandfather was alive right now, he would have come and kissed your face twice. Uh, <laughs> As you said, you know, I, I, I once uh, had some titles, but I gave them all up in Brooklyn, New York, so I'm, I'm now a, uh, I'm, I'm just a jo average Joe. Uh, it would be a little hard for me to defend monarchy because, uh, uh, because of that. Uh, yeah, my, my family once ruled that country called Afghanistan, so they didn't do a very good job, so I'm not very proud of it. Uh, they're pretty messed it up. Uh, but, this question has again been raised before. A uh, case of Afghanistan, uh, those of you who don't know it, the king of Afghanistan was in Rome. Uh, he went to Afghanistan and he actually wanted to become a president, believe it or not. A royal president, if there's such a thing. And that was rejected mainly by the United States. For the US, the main issue was what? We did the same thing in Iraq. Iraq had a, there's, there was, it wasn't very powerful, but Hussein is a descendant of the kings of Iraq, who actually are, by the way, from Saudi Arabia, but that doesn't matter, but they're there, they used to be ruling Iraq, and uh, that was rejected. That was not even included. For the U.S., the issue is, the United States of America ousted a monarch. We have never been a monarchy. The colonies war, but the United States is a country that stands against monarchy. So how can the United States reinstall monarchies? I don't buy this debate. Yes, Spain was very successful. Actually, Spain is a good question. I mean, I mean, Franco, yeah, Franco, Franco successfully brought a monarchy. This question has, 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 has been raised before. Uh, in case of Morocco and Jordan, uh, Morocco is a much more natural monarchy, and I hope there are any Jordanian here and forgive me. I think Jordan is a very unnatural monarchy. Jordan is a country, if there is the most, and again, it's a very good ally of ours, so I don't mean, I'm not bad-mouthing anybody, trust me. Uh, I love Jordan, I go there a lot. But Jordan is the, maybe the most artificial country in the Middle East. There has never been such a thing called Jordan. The reason we have Jordan is because this, the British had this Arab guy from what is today Saudi Arabia, and they didn't know where to put him. So there it was. Uh, the king of Jordan should actually be ruling a hijaz. He's a, he's a hijazi. 
Hijaz is where? Where Mecca and Medina are. In Jeddah. So the stability of Jordan is, is, is I'm glad it's stable, but you know, we are working very hard. Let's put it this way. Publicly, I can tell you that we are working very, very hard to make it, to keep it stable. Uh, and, and Israel is working very hard to keep it stable. And the Saudis are pushing a lot of money to keep it stable. It's not a natural phenomenon that's stable. The amount of money and oil and weapons and, and trading that goes on there to keep it afloat is a lot. Morocco is a whole different thing. Uh, so is it an answer? A constitutional monarchy? Perhaps. Some people say in case of Iraq, that Iraq, a monarchy, brings in an ideal that is beyond Shia, Sunni, Kurd. It is the, the, the identity of the monarch can maybe be an umbrella under which you have these divisions. Uh, goes back to the question you asked. If the people of the region today vote for a monarchy, I think Afghans would have voted for a monarchy. Again, I'm saying this with a caveat because somebody says, you know what, you're self-promoting. Maybe there will be an ambassador back here and I would have stayed. But that's besides the point. I think Afghans would have voted for Zahir Shah. I don't have a doubt to be a presidential king or whatever. Uh, but it is hard for the West, at least for the U.S. at the time, to allow a democratization process which leads to a monarchy. Uh, I'm not going to answer you directly because I think I don't have an answer directly. Is it, is, is it the solution? It could be going back to your question. Maybe one of those tools to we, if the people of the region want a monarchy, who are we to say no? And again, you're bringing a very good case in the case of Spain. Franco basically groomed a monarch. So there was a transition from a fascist system, where Franco was a fascist, let's put it this way. I mean, he wasn't that. And then you have a, a, a Spain which is now a democracy. So uh, could be, yes. I don't think we can formalize that. If the region itself wants it, I don't think we should stop it, in my view. We have no right to, because our solutions have not worked very well. So I don't know if that's an uh, answer that you're accepting, but my grandfather would have loved you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there is a raised hand over there. In the, in the, third, in the third line. I apologize. I shall be speaking in Czech because it is easier for me. Počkejte, počkejte, prosím chvíli. Když v letech 1938 a 1939 Německo obsadilo Českou republiku, tak lidi buď zůstali v České republice, anebo ti, co odešli, tak vstoupili do zahraničních armád a bojovali za, proti Německu za jeho porážkou. Víte, mohli byste prosím říci, za jakým účelem teda utíkají lidé z arabských zemích, zejména teda z Iráku a, a z Afganistánu a, a za Sýrie, jejich, jejich cílem prostě bojovat, nebo jsou ty, tyto lidi připraveni bojovat za svobodu své země, vstoupit do armády, vytvořit nějaké legie a, a bojovat za, za nějaký systém, který podle jejich názoru prostě by jim vyhovoval, či nikoliv, či chtějí tady jako rozrušit, zničit prostě náš systém a, a zavíst to. A druhá otázka je Severo Atlantický pakt ve válce s, s islámským státem, či nikoliv. A pokud ano, tak je to, myslíte si, že ta válka, kterou vede na to proti islámskému státu, je dostatečná a pomohly by prostě armáda vytvořená právě z těch běženců, pokud by byli ochotní prostě bojovat za osvobození své země z toho, z područí toho islámského státu. Děkujeme. Yeah, 
sorry, okay. Uh, I got it. I said, very good translation, thank you. I, the first example of wh why are not they fighting in Afghanistan or Syria or Iraq uh, and they're coming here, as you said, to destroy the system. The t there are two issues. There are people fighting. There are people fighting in Iraq, as we speak. Uh, Syria has lost almost 200,000 people for different factions fighting. So what you see, the refugees, Syrian refugees did not start coming until very recently to Europe. Right now in Turkey, there are almost 1.3 million Syrians, the largest refugee population anywhere right now. Lebanon is number two, almost a million. Jordan is number three, 600,000. So they are fighting at the same time as there are some people who, when you lose, look, I'm a warrior, I was a Marine, I know how to fight, but at the same time I know where to go when fighting ends. But if you have no place to go, and your family is also in danger, meaning your family has no place to live, and violence is used indiscriminately, and this is where IS, where IS becomes very powerful because they use terror as a tool. And here I, I mean terror in the sense of the, uh, going back to the French Revolution, the reign of terror. The word terrorism actually comes from the French Revolution. What is terror? In the US military we say, beat the chicken, scare the monkey. Beat the chicken, scare the monkey. I hit this bottle so hard that he thinks that, you know, if he can destroy this bottle so much, what is he going to do to me? And IS is, by violence, is scaring everybody out of the field. Violence, indiscriminate violence, like the Nazis used it. Again, I give you another example, because you brought 1938. You had Mussolini and you had Hitler. Hitler was a regime of terror, meaning what? The Jews had not, done nothing against them, but they would kill them. I would have been killed because I was born with a cliff palate. So I was an invalid. I had nothing against the state, but I would have been killed just because. Whereas in Mussolini, we call Mussolini a regime of repressive regime. It wasn't a good regime, but if you didn't, act, you didn't go against Mussolini, he wouldn't kill you. IS is not that. The Yazidis have done nothing against IS, but they're being killed just because they're Yazidis. So this creates a situation where the odds are against you. We only fight when we think we have a chance of winning. If you don't think you have a chance of winning, you don't fight. The second part of that question of yours, sir, saying that they're here to destroy your system. I agree that there could be p people in the group that comes in undocumented who are IS operatives, absolutely. But I don't think the majority of them are here to destroy your system. They may destroy your system because they don't assimilate. But their, their main intention is not destruction of the system. The main intention of the majority, again, minority could be uh, agents of IS, agents of Iran, who knows who's coming. Because once you're undocumented, anybody can send it people. However, the majority of them, the key word is survival. People don't humiliate themselves to that region when food is thrown at them like dogs for, for anything but survival. So there is a, we have to balance this out. As I said, it's a huge problem. And I know the dangers. I'm very aware of the dangers. And I don't discount them. Trust me, I don't discount them. But we have to always see that. So this is a second question, NATO and IS. Here, if I speak diplomatically, I can't tell you that. They, look, NATO is not fighting IS. Certain countries within NATO are fighting IS. NATO as a whole, and I hate to say this, NATO as a whole is a organization that is, it's not functioning the way it was supposed to function. Whether it's IS or whether even, you know, maybe at, at the threat that is happening in the, in the Eastern Front, they may get back together a little bit more. Uh, number one, here I may wear my official hat. Only five countries in NATO are putting the money that they pledged to voluntarily put, which is 2% of their GDP, gross domestic product. Only five countries of 26 or whatever they are, or 29. So 
NATO is not doing its job, and no, NATO is not fighting IS. There are certain countries within NATO, and most of those are fighting very, almost by, uh, without direction, haphazardly without any strategic aim. If you ask most of the NATO countries who are fighting, what is your end game? We don't have an end game, and I would include my own country here. We do not have a strategy. IS has a strategy, we have tactics. And I, guess, I don't know if you're ever in the military, a strategy always wins over tactic. We are tactically trying to confront them. All we are trying to do is we are trying to mitigate the threat. We try to control the violence. We are not trying to solve anything. And we collectively, and yes, NATO is not fighting ISIS. NATO is, 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 is not even collectively thinking about it. They all got together because of Article 4 that Turkey called about. But again, only four countries came specifically to do something about it. What is, what is talking? What is action? Unfortunately, when it comes to action, there's not much coming from NATO. I, I have to be very blunt about that. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman in the red shirt, please. Okay. I heard many times about uh, democracy in Malaysia and Indonesia and the possibility to have democratization with ISIS or Daesh. But as uh, you think it will be possible to have democratization in Saudi Arabia? This is... No. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question over there. Thank you. By the way, are there some people from Saudi Arabia present? Are there some Jordanians present? No. Uh, good evening. I wanted to ask you, uh, we are just uh, talking about politics, which is logical because we are in uh, several institutes, but uh, don't, you, don't you think that uh, the problems of uh, today's M Middle East are more uh, social, economic, uh, and these, uh, uh, let's say, organizations like ISIS are just symptoms of uh, this problem? Because you mentioned uh, Egypt several times, and uh, I want to use uh, this uh, uh, as an example, because uh, uh, 2000, uh, 200 years, uh, the population of Czech Republic was like uh, 4 million people and Egypt was the same. But now we have 10 million people and Egypt has over 80 million. So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. No, definitely. I mean, uh, politics is never outside of socio-economic issues. Uh, just because I, I come in from more myself, from a more political science security dimension rather than the social economic, which I understand. If not that, and, and I think social economic is, is, is the harder question. And it will go back to the question. It's the more, it's the harder question, but if you tackle it, whether internally or externally, it will have a much more long lasting effect. Uh, you know, there's no question about that. But I say, and also, I mean, usually this whole idea, and if you look at, at the American idea of why we wanted to promote democracy was this whole notion, which I don't think is correct, that democracies don't fight each other. They do. Uh, but the idea was that they don't fight each other and that if you, democracies also lead to socioeconomic prosperity, which in most cases they do. In most cases, not always. When you have a free enterprise, when you have a access to uh, rule of law, because you can't have even investments in a country where there is no rule of law. When there's corruption beyond imagination, you can't invest. Again, good example, Russia, China. It's very hard to invest in Russia, whereas in China, thousands of companies from America to Germany, everybody's investing. Why? Because in China, the rules of law are very straightforward. You don't have to bribe every Chinese official to get something done there. That's why every other thing you look at is says made in China. There's a reason for that. It's cheaper labor, but also there's a rule of law. So, yes, socioeconomic aspect 
allows those to happen. But I don't think ISIS is only because of socioeconomic problems. Uh, the question, again, we, we heard about the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, if it was just socioeconomic issues, you would have not have had a major support by, to Daesh in a country such as Saudi Arabia. Or something that we have said time and again, we just had the 14th anniversary of 9-11. There were 19 of them, of which 15 came from the richest countries in the world, not the downtrodden. So yes, but no, not always. Uh, I, I agree social economic is, is an aspect that makes, creates problems, uh, raises tensions. People fight more because you have nothing to lose or you want to gain something. But I think Daesh is a little bit more than that. They have resentment does create violence. When you think that you have, the word, if the, if the word I'll, I'll say it last word for you, is the issue of justice. There is this notion within certain Islamic circles that they have been unjustly treated by the whoever, West, the leaders of their own people, what, you, you fill the gap, but there's injustice, social injustice, yeah, I, I'll use your term, and that social injustice has to be changed through violence, because the slow motion or, or gradual has never helped them. So this is, this, is, this is what I see there going on. I hope I have answered your question. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, that there is a discussion going on where the, where the, the <coughs> sorry, where the democracy please is Please speak up a bit, please. We don't hear you whether democracy is compatible with Sharia. But isn't the main problem the level of violence and cruelty? I mean, after all, uh, many of our laws and even what we consider normal as a, as a society, it is still heavily influenced by Christianity. But it was watered down so that basically you can voice your opinions and don't have to fear to get killed. So. Basically, what I want to ask is whether violence shouldn't be the first step rather than... Look, again, by, by training, I'm a historian. You just said that in Christianity, the, the debate we have, what I said was that in order for Europe to have had the success that we have today, it had to go through a lot of violence to get to a point where they freedom of conscience both at home, meaning in private, and then later on, and most importantly, in public was established. I mean, talk about rights of women. In this very part of the world, I'm not saying Czech Republic, but Europe, not that many years ago, if you left your wife at home, you will, she would have to wear a chastity belt. Right now you find it in museums. So she could not sleep with somebody else. That was a reality. Women's status, even today, yes, I'm a feminist, because for whatever reason, I, I grew up with a, with a woman. So, the, even today, in your country, I don't know about your country, but I can tell you France, I can tell you United States, if I do a job, a woman does the same job, she will get less. They will get less promotion. So, those are all there, they're all gradual. So, it's not that Christianity initially accepted all of that. It had to come through dialogue. It had to come, unfortunately, through a lot of fire and, and burning and killing and, 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 and f fake promises. I'm hoping that, I'm really hoping that Middle East doesn't go through all that Europe went to to get to where you are. So you're right. Violence, violence is, is a tool that right now is being used because violence works. Works towards an end, which I don't think is just social economic, but it is beyond that. How do you change that paradigm where violence becomes not a tool to promote any specific idea? The dialogue, that a uh, mutual understanding of the other comes in. And when will that break come in? I don't know. In Europe, we all have, you know, we, we think that in Europe it was the Enlightenment. And it didn't start overnight. You have a lot of back and forth, a lot of back and forth. And a lot of, as I said, again, uh, right here somewhere there's a statue of Jan Hus, what happened to him, right? Uh, 
it, it kept on going back and forth, and it was a lot of uh, cheating going on, a lot of false promises taking place. And as I said, right now in the Middle East, we are not even at that level. Right now in the Middle East, there's only one truth. If you don't accept that truth, you don't belong to the community. And if you don't belong to the community, you either have to leave, kick out, or we kill you. This dialogue has to change. And it is slowly changing. The fact that there is a debate whether Sharia, and first of all, what is Sharia? There's no one Sharia. But whether Sharia, which is basically in Arabic means a path, uh, whether that path to a perfection of Islamic world, whatever that is, if that can be achieved with understanding given rise to others. In the Islamic world, by the way, we just keep on talking about the Ottomans. Ottomans, I know in this part of the world, Austria and all that, the Ottomans have a very bad name. They were not such a bad empire. But then you look at it through imperial sins, they left a lot of people alone. I just came from, I, I did a tour of certain countries for work. I, I was both in, 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 in uh, former Yugoslavia, basically, to, to uh, Croatia and, and Bosnia, then I went to Bulgaria and Romania. And you look deeper into these things, there was a coexistence. There were some fights and some killings and some conversions, but there was also a coexistence. So in the Islamic system, what they look at, it wasn't about cleansing everybody. This is a very irredentist, very narrow thinking, and unfortunately, one thing about Daesh, they don't have great thinkers among them. They have a lot of thinkers to, for, for internet. They're great at internet. But they don't have thinkers who think, even at the level of Maududi, who wrote about Islamic State. They don't have intellectual discourses going on at a high level. And until that happens, within the power structure, I think you, you kind of keep on getting because they're winning right now. This is what is, believe it or not, the youth in this, among you, maybe not here, but hopefully, but among Europeans who look at that and they, they actually look at that as a positive thing. Maybe out of boredom, maybe out of the, just, just the malaise of life. So they're winning. And this is where it goes back to your question, sir. I think for us, it's incumbent on us to make sure that they are not comfortable and they win. Because if they win, that allows the, the propaganda tool to keep on growing in this, its, its, its veracity. So uh, I, I went all the way around, but, but uh, I hope that partially answers your question. Uh, th there is another hand raised near, yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jan. Uh, thank you, Professor, for a very informative and interesting uh, briefing. Um, although there is much to discuss uh, and dispute with what you said, um, but there is one aspect really that really got my attention when you mentioned that that Saudi Arabia is actually um, supporting Daesh. Oh, I'm sorry, then I, mis I, I, I misheard you because... Oh yes, well, there are. I say the the question was that there was a uh, uh, about rich and poor. I said no. There are a lot of Saudis living in one of the richest countries in the world who are looking up to Daesh. That's what I said. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm okay. sorry. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Sorry, I didn't recognize you. There is another uh, hand over there raised. And the last, yes. yeah. My question, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, my question is, do you think that these refugees who are now joining uh, Europe, do you think... My vás neslyšíme, zkuste víc na hlas, nebo pojďte k nám blíž. My question is, uh, these, uh, all these refugees that are, uh, are now coming to Europe and maybe they will stay here, do you think it can contribute to this uh, dialogue or to this democratic uh, process in uh, the Middle East? Look, the refugees are surviving. I, 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 as I said, the refugee problem is a, is a real problem with Europeans, specifically right now the Europeans 
have a dilemma. I think the Arab countries do too. In my view, uh, countries such as Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey have taken their share. I am not a citizen of the Gulf countries. The Gulf countries need to do their share, in my view. Humanists, they do a lot of money, but to bring them, but people are afraid of them. But this is a, I don't think the refugees are an issue. Right now they're desperate. People who are desperate, they're trying to get some food in their hand or save their children. I don't think you can have them to have a political dialogue. Uh, it is, it is, it's, it's, it's inconceivable. When you are trying to survive, it is inconceivable. I just mean later, in the future. Yeah, I just want to see something positive yeah, on it. Uh, it depends. Again, that's, that's an open question. I don't know what happens to them. I mean, eventually, a solution has to be found. In my view, the solution has to be internal there, because absorption of this many people uh, may not be possible. Uh, because, I, as I said, unfortunately, a lot of these people who come there, I'm a refugee, so I'm not saying, and I, I'm, a, I'm a full refugee, not once, but three times. When a refugee comes to a different country, you have to accept certain things. You have to accept to respect the laws of the country you come. A lot of these people do not. It is not to change your religion. Nobody is forcing anybody to change their religion. It's not that you have to eat pork, but there are certain things you have to do, which I mentioned. One is that you can't go crazy over anybody's statement that you think is offensive to your religion. Two, you cannot, if one of your citizens, one of your brothers or sisters tries to be either an atheist or a Christian or Jew, you cannot kill him. Because that, the law of these countries allows that. And thirdly, as I said, for me, it's the right of women. What you do in the Middle East is different. That's a different part of the world. Laws are different. But you come here, you have to, again, in public, in my view, respect the laws of here. I go to the Middle East, I respect, the, I mean, I'm partially from there. But I travel there, I respect the laws there. I go to Saudi Arabia a lot. I work there. I respect the laws. But when a refugee comes here, whether it's me or X or why? We assume we come to France or Germany, but we want to live exactly as we were living in the ghetto in, in Cairo or Damascus or Kabul. That's impossible. And that is, impo and that is the big problem of, of the longer question, is the assimilation. Some do assimilate. You know, what, what you said, I think, you know, about Steve Jobs, who was a Syrian refugee, correct? He was. Steve Jobs' last name was not Jobs. He was a Syrian refugee. So, refugees have also given a lot to America. Our president's father was a refugee. So, there's positive and negative. Albert Einstein was a refugee. We got lucky to get him, and not the Russians. If not, the world would have been very different. No, really, honestly. Had the Russians gotten Albert Einstein and, and Oppenheimer, the world would have been very different today. So refugees can bring positive in, 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 in the world too. What I'm trying to say is this mass of humanity coming in, desperate. I don't think they're here to change your system, but they may change your system because of lack of systems. So what Europe does, I'm not a European citizen. You can't wall yourself though, I can tell you that. You cannot wall yourself. You have to find a different solution. I don't know what that solution is. You, can't, you cannot do that. Again, you know, we talked about, about countries such as, you know, in Arab world, rich countries in the Arab world. They're having a big problem. Their youth is going towards Daesh. In countries, as I just mentioned, such as Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, if you're a Saudi citizen, you have a very high standard of living. So why are they doing that? That goes, goes back to this issue. It's not socioeconomic. It's something else, and we haven't pinpointed that yet. If you're a Saudi citizen, you get free education, you can go to the best colleges in the world, they even send you outside of the country, or within their universities, or some of the best universities, in the sense of scientific, yet they're, they're attracted to this absolute crazy idea. The question is, why? And these come here, 
and they want to change the same idea in, in part of Europe. And, and I, just, I don't think they're part of dialogue yet. Right now it's an issue of survival and the issue of assimilation, those who stay here. The dialogue has to happen within those countries. And I think, this is a, beyond your question, I think the dialogue has to happen within the religious communities in countries such as Egypt, such as Saudi Arabia, such as Syria, well Syria right now is in a bad shape, that these religious communities begin a dialogue which is not always that the West has done bad things. There's a question by but. I even, you know, I listened to the, the, the khutbas, you know, these are Friday sermons. They say a lot of things against Daesh, but there's always a but. But the West has done that. But Israel, it's nothing to do with Israel, sorry. That's absolutely nothing to do with Israel. But the poor Palestinians, this has nothing to do with Palestinians. Or but the Iranians. The Iranians, yeah, they're kind of playing a bad game there. But, but the question is, you, I, I hear this but always. They say no. The issue of Israel and Palestine has to be solved. Iran is playing a very bad game. But let's talk about this just by itself. I don't hear that. I don't hear it from the Egyptians. I don't hear it from the Mufti. I'm talking about the religious people. You hear to them, it's always a but. And this is why the youth in some of the richest countries in the world are attracted to this Daesh because they feel that this is maybe a new phenomenon. And some of them will come right here. That's what, what's going to happen. Uh, thank you. Maybe the last question of this evening. Yeah, there is one hand raised on this side. Hello, Dr. Tarzi. Uh, I would like to ask you one question and to continue on the topic with the refugees. Please speak louder. Oh, sorry. Uh, how, how your point of view on the situation uh, with the different solutions from the different European countries to the, towards the refugee, of course, problem and the change of the, how to say, uh, not a solution, uh, approach uh, towards the refugees from the Germany and Aust Austria. And of course, if you would compare the solutions we, the European, European Union, or the European states implement towards the refugees and the situation in the United States towards the Mex Mexicans and the solutions that you implemented there. Thank you. That's my question. Uh, again, as I said, I'm not a European citizen. Uh, all I can say is when you join the EU, you join with the good and the bad. You can't say that, you know, you can get all the roads and the help and education and the Erasmuses and this and that, but when the problem comes in, no, that's not my problem. I, you know, Germans are big, they should take care of it. Austrians are diverse, no, it's, it's part of your, your European Union, it is part of your problem. Whatever the solution is, it has to be collective. If not, EU does not exist. Uh, that's all I have to say about collective responsibility. I think you can't just choose that, you know, we get we get this, this support, this support, but this is trouble. I'm going to put a barbed wire on my border and, and, and throw food at people. You just can't, it just can't happen. What, I'm not saying the solution is to get everybody at home. I'm telling you it's a dangerous situation. At the same time, I say it's not a German problem. This is not a French problem. This is a European issue. And it has to have a European answer. As far as my country is concerned, look, right now, we have candidates in our election that are, are talking about a wall and this and that. I think, look, America is a country of refugees. And I'm here saying this as, as myself, as a refugee again. First thing I did to America when I came in is I learned English. Maybe I'm not perfect, but I can speak the language. Second thing I did, I never took a second, single penny of welfare. I worked from day one I came to America. Thirdly, I joined the Marine Corps voluntarily to defend the constitution of that United States of America which gave me land. If I came to your country, this is my country of birth too, I would do exactly the same. I learn your language, I will work, and I will do service, whether it's military service or police, something to give back to society. Citizenship is a responsibility, it's a mutual responsibility. So whoever comes to any country, whether it's in America or here, and just takes and believes that this is their right, there's a problem in there. 
Assimilation with our biggest problem in America is assimilation of languages. Not any other language, but one specific language. We are creating a ghetto system in our own country where you have a majority who speak a language which not, is, is just refusing to assimilate. And what you're creating, and not maybe in five years or ten years, you're creating a literally a, get, a linguistic ghetto system in our country. So you need to bring about that change because it, it, I don't know if you've been to the U.S., you can go to any form we have or any store you go to buy a deodorant or a can of beer, it's now in two languages almost. So it's easy to live with that second language, but then there's a ceiling, what we call a glass ceiling. How you go beyond that. And that's important. Yes, at the same time, we have Supreme Court justices. We have, you know, we, call, we don't call them ministers, but cabinet members. So there is a simulation at one level. Look at our president. That is, I think, as an American, whether I vote for her or not, is absolutely not part of it. As an American, I'm very proud to have a man whose father was born in Africa today finishing his term next year. Was he the best president or worst president? Neither. He was... He did something good, something's bad, we can discuss that somewhere else. I'm not going to discuss it in public. I work for him. Uh, but the fact that we had that, I think, shows a lot about our democracy. It's not perfect. Trust me, it's not. We have a, holes this big. But it's a recognition of those holes. But the refugees who come in, do they accept America as what it is or not? And some do, some don't. And those who don't are a trouble for, are a problem for the assimilation and creation of that society. You have the same issue. You are not a country of refugees. You're totally different. You are 10 million people, basically the same people. We are a country of refugees. But which two kinds of refugees? Those who become part of this America, the melting pot, I'm not talking about the idealistic, but we part, become part of it. The only reason I joined the Marine Corps, I'm not a militarist person. I was chased by the Soviets at, at age 14. That was enough military for me. Uh, it was to pay back. To become a citizen. And that's not happening in every case. A lot of cases it is. In some cases it's not. And how we balance that is a big question. And this, again, as I said, for you as the European, it's not a German problem. It's your problem as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tarzi. I think it was very, uh, very optimistic uh, end. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for all the opinions that you shared with us. Of course, I would like to thank uh, several institutes for making this event possible. And of course, I thank to all of you who came and uh, listened to the lecture. Thank you and good evening.